Well, this morning we're going to be continuing in the saga that is the book of Genesis. And we're going to be turning to Genesis uh, chapter 29 this morning. Um, but just as a bit of a, a, a recap before we read those verses in chapter 29. In chapter 28, we saw how the Lord met with Jacob on his journey to Haran and, and how he brought him to himself during that journey from his from his family home to, to Laban's home in Haran. Uh, and Jacob now in, in chapter 29 continues on his journey to Haran where he'll stay with his uncle there, his uncle Laban. And he'll lay low for just a little while. That's what that's what Rachel thought anyway, that he'd, be, he'd just lay low for a little while uh, while his, his brother Esau just chills out a little bit and stops trying to kill him. OK, so let's read now from those verses in chapter 29. And see how the, the story continues to unfold um, in Jacob's life. Let's read those verses. Genesis chapter 29 and starting to read at verse 1. Then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. There he saw a well in the open country with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll away the stone from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob asked the shepherds, My brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, Do you know, my, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked, asked them, is he well? Yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with his sheep. Look, he said, the sun, sun's still high and it's not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and, and take them back to the pasture. We can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel's daughter, but Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. So she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob and his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him for a month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder one was Leah and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, my time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Jacob, so Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? 
Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the elder one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Well, it's important to note that before Jacob started out on this journey to his uncle Laban's, Isaac, his father, had also instructed him to find a wife whilst he's in Haran. This was essential if the promise and blessing of Jesus was going to continue to be worked out through his family. When Jacob finally arrives in the vicinity of Haran, he spots some local shepherds who've gathered at the well uh, to water their sheep. Now, who knows exactly why Jacob went over to them? Maybe he's thirsty. That would be understandable, wouldn't it, after a long journey? Maybe he's glad just to see another person after his long journey. Or maybe he just wants to ask for some direction to his uncle Laban's house. Well, after telling them that, uh, after telling him that they're from Haran, uh, that they know his uncle Laban and that he's all well and good, they say, oh, you see over there, that's his daughter Rachel uh, coming to water his sheep. Now, as we just thought, Jacob may well have come to this well for many reasons, but he certainly wasn't expecting to find a wife. But not quite so soon, I don't expect. But as, as he looks up to the person that these shepherds were pointing to, I'm sure that cutting crews, I just died in your arms tonight, was the anthem of his heart. He would have, he wouldn't, sorry, he would have been just as surprised in these very similar circumstances as Abraham's servant had been. You remember that? At the speed at which God gave him success and provided the wife his father wanted for him. And eager to make a good first impression and to win her favour and, and his uncle's favour, he turns to the strapping lads around him as she approaches. And he, and he basically, says, basically says, hey, fellas, I, I know the sun's still high up in, in the sky and it's not quite time to, to water the sheep. But how about we lift the lid off this thing and uh, get, make an early start and get it over and done with? When they just said no, Jacob's undeterred and he single-handedly sweat dropping, muscles rippling in the glistening midday sun. And he rolled away this large rock in order to water Rachel's sheep. He then kissed his cousin and wept aloud. Once again, he's overwhelmed by the love and, and care of God in the way that he's brought him safely now to his destination and in the way that he brought this beautiful woman into his life. And Rachel, for her part, seems equally pleased to make Jacob's acquaintance. As soon as she realises that He's a relative. She runs to go and tell her father of his arrival and what he's done for her. Laban's immediately impressed and excited to hear about the circumstances of Jacob's arrival, arrival. probably for a number of reasons. As he says, he's his own flesh and blood. He's never met him before, so he must have been excited to, to get to know him and, and to learn from him how his sister Rebecca is. And also, he's excited because the Lord is clearly with this young man. He's enabled him to, to achieve this, this great feat of strength in, in moving this large stone that it normally took many shepherds to move away from the well. 
Lastly, he's excited because it's quite plain to see that Jacob and his daughter are, are, are pretty interested in one another. And for all those reasons, Laban ran to meet him, embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. Once there, it says in verse 13 that Jacob, Jacob told him about all these things. Now, it doesn't tell us about what all these things were, but no doubt that means that he told him about his deceit to his father and brother, about his being sent away for those reasons to stay with Laban. That's why he's there. And no doubt, he, all of these things means that he also told him about his meeting with God along the way. And, and also about all the events that had just happened um, at the well as he met with Rachel. You know, after all of the apprehension and uncertainty over the future that Jacob would have felt after being kicked out of the family home in chapter 27... It must have been such an encouragement, such a such a comfort for him to have been received so well by by a loving uncle, whilst at the same time being in the daily presence of the woman of his dreams. After that first month, he would have felt more adjusted and and more settled into his new home than he ever could have imagined just a few weeks ago, you remember just a few weeks ago when he was in the middle of nowhere and going through the lowest and, and most uh, lost period of his life. This is unbelievably good in contrast to that. And then life goes from good to great for Jacob because Laban asks him what his wages should be in exchange for the work that he's going to be doing for him. And there's like, no hesitation whatsoever. You can almost hear the, the duh in Jacob's voice as he says, well, Rachel, he's, he's so super keen that he immediately offers seven years of work to pay for Rachel's bride, bridal price. Now, that is an extortionately steep price to pay for a bride in those days. But it seems that Jacob is willing to, to he's not willing to risk a no from his uncle. Now, we know that Laban has an eye for the dollar, don't we? You remember when he gave his, daughter, his sister Re Rebecca uh, away to Isaac in marriage. Uh, and he did that in exchange for an incredible amount of cash. And so he coolly accepts Jacob's offer. Oh, it, it's better that I give her to you than, than some other man. Yeah, you, you stay here with me. You stay right here, Jacob. And those seven years flew by for Jacob and were even sweeter than that first month. He would have taken every opportunity that he could have done to, to help Rachel out with the sheep, just as he had done at the well. And he would have wanted to spend every waking hour that he could um, in her presence, getting to know her and, and enjoying her company, the company of his future wife. And just as if he's he's measuring time on like this, this gigantic egg timer, he says to Laban, as the seven years are up, right, that's it. Time's up. Give me my wife so I can make love to her. <laughs> Just what every father-in-law in waiting is longing to hear from uh, their, their, uh, <laughs> their future son-in-law, I'm sure. But as clumsy as his, his choice of words might have been, his keenness does show us the innocence and godliness of his relationship with Rachel up until that point. He loved her very, very much and, and he, was, he was happy to honour her and to respect her and her body and wait until the big day before he expressed that love that he had for her in a sexual way. So, in due course, true to his word, Laban sent out all the invitations for this wedding and he set up all the tables ready for this 
wedding feast. But in amongst all of that, Laban also set up a trap. Just as Jacob had set up a trap for his family about seven and a half years before, Laban had orchestrated a deceitful scheme, a scheme to steal a blessing for his more cosmetically challenged, so we say, firstborn daughter, Leah. It was his plan to, to marry her off to Jacob without his knowledge. Now that sounds like a pretty hard plan to pull off, doesn't it? I mean, it's one thing to, to fool a poor old blind man into blessing the wrong son. But to get a young man with 20-20 with vision uh, to marry the, the wrong sister? Now that surely would be the steal of the century for Laban. But just like his sister, Rebecca, uh, and Jacob, his nephew, before him. He's more than equal to this task. Deceit obviously runs deep in the veins of this family because it seems to come very naturally to them, doesn't it? Laban, Rebecca, Jacob, even Rachel, as we'll see later on in Genesis, that they're all just as bad as each other. They're all deceitful in this way. Now, in the passage, all, all verse 22 tells us uh, about uh, Jacob and Rachel's big day is, uh, so Laban brought together all the people of that place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Now, under the surface of these brief and easily overlooked verses there's an elaborate and resourceful hoax underway i'm reliably informed by uh, one writer by the writer of this welling commentary uh, that weddings at that time um, involved um, yeah, weddings in that part of the world in those times normally involved processions to and from the bride's house, a reading of the marriage contract and a large meal attended by both family and neighbours. In th it, the first day's celebration ended with the groom wrapping his cloak around the bride who was veiled throughout the ceremony and taking her to the nuptial, cha nuptial chamber where the marriage was consummated. Well, all of that would have happened on the day of Jacob and Rachel's wedding. And in that sense, it was a normal wedding day for the times. A day of great celebration, no doubt enjoyed immensely by the happy couple and all those in attendance. But then evening came. And under the cover of darkness, Laban put his sinister scheme into action. After Rachel and Jacob had enjoyed their wedding day together, Laban swapped Rachel and Leah just before the nuptial, nuptial chamber bit. Now, there's no reason to believe that Rachel wasn't happy to take Jacob as her husband. We've already seen her, something of her enthusiasm towards this man. And for that reason, there's no reason at all to believe that she was happy and, and, and that she had any involvement in the planning of this deceit. It seems as though both Rachel and Leah, who proves herself to be quite godly later on, it seems that they were both manipulated like a pair of rag dolls in these events. Innocent victims in what was a tremendous abuse of power by their father, Laban. Right up until the end of the day, Rachel was under the, the impression that this was her big day. But then at the 11th hour, Laban seems to, to smuggle her off the scene 
to silence her and to, to shut her away somewhere out of Jacob's sight. He'd also secretly made, uh, secretly had another wedding dress made for Philea. He, he dressed her up in it like a Barbie doll and he told her to keep her mouth shut and just like shoved her in front of Jacob on his wedding night. Uh, it doesn't, now at this point, it doesn't matter how meticulous and cunning Laban's planning had been. There's no getting away from the fact that, that this was now Leah and not Rachel standing in front of Jacob. Laban can't do anything about that. He can't have made any preparations for that apart from to, to shove Leah in front of Jacob with this veil over her face. But that, that, that wouldn't have been enough to, to have fooled Jacob. But you know, Jacob, even though Laban, sorry, even though he, he couldn't do anything about what was going to happen next, there's no planning that he could do uh, to, to, to account for, for the possibility that Jacob would, would recognize Leah. He didn't need to make any plans. He didn't need to, anything, to do anything about it. All he needed to do now is, is step back and just let nature take its course. Now, Jacob wouldn't have been so stupid ordinarily to have taken the wrong sister to the nuptial chamber. But intoxicated by the joyful, no doubt alcohol fueled celebrations of the day and with a deep desire and passion to get to know his fiance of seven years a little bit better to fulfill his, his duty as the chosen one. Uh, and surrounded by the utter darkness as well of that night, Jacob took the bait that Laban had set for him and he made love to Leah. Safe to say, Jacob had the shock of his life the following morning to wake up to his new wife, Leah. He must have felt sick to the pit of his stomach to have been deceived and betrayed like that by who was previously a loving uncle, Laban. And for his love to have, for his love uh, for Rachel to have been betrayed in such a way as well. You see, all along he'd only ever had eyes for her, for his beautiful Rachel, hadn't he? He'd, he'd never taken so much of a second look at Leah. He didn't think that she was much to behold and his heart simply didn't belong to her. Understandably, he is absolutely furious with Laban. What is this you have done to me? He says, I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? In response, Laban gives some lame excuse about not being able to marry off his younger daughter before the older one. But, you know, fair enough, kind of. But surely you should have made Jacob aware of that situation, that little minor detail before consenting to him uh, to marry Rachel. Uh, and, 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 and even so, you had no right to violate him and, and your two daughters with this gross act of mental, physical, emotional and sexual abuse that they experienced at his hand. One thing's for sure, Laban can be glad that Jacob is a changed man, otherwise he might have subjected him to a bit of his own physical abuse. Verse 27 reveals that uh, the, the, the reason why Laban has orchestrated this, this awful act of deceit. He wanted to tie Jacob down. He wanted to keep him for yet another seven years of work in exchange now for Rachel. He'd done seven years for, for Leah, um, little did he know. And now Laban is saying he'd do another seven years for, for Rachel, 14 years in total. Despite his fury, Jacob gets his head down and gets on with it. And in exchange, 
Jacob and Rachel were finally and unceremoniously united together in marriage. What a come down to what would have been a wonderful anticipation for all of those seven years and what seemed to be a great big day for them both. And now it's just kind of it's just mentioned like as a as a by the by in that verse that they're yeah, they're, they're married off as well. Well, again, what a mess. Genesis is a catalogue of messy events, isn't it? Where, where God's patient faithfulness has to triumph over humanity's unfaithfulness again and again. And how is that the case here? How is God working through the sad tale of chapter 29? Uh, now, some say it's commonly held to that, that Jacob is being taught by, by God here. He's being taught a lesson, if you like. Is God teaching Jacob that what goes around comes around in chapter 29? Is it a case of this once very deceitful man getting a taste of his own medicine from this mass manipulator, Laban? Well, certainly the irony of these events wouldn't have been lost on Jacob. It would have all been very close and uncomfortable for him. It would have touched a nerve and, and dredged up some horrible memories of his own family betrayal. And no doubt feeling the hurt of this kind of betrayal for himself when it had been done to him helped him to appreciate to a, to a greater extent what he'd done to his father and to his brother. However, we've got to remember that Jacob had entered now into a personal relationship with the God of heaven. And that means that, that God no longer holds his sins against him. They're forgiven now. They're stored up until the day of Christ's coming. You know, maybe, likely, recent events made Jacob stand in awe of all that God had forgiven him once again. And it's likely that these events had made him draw closer to the one who had given him access to heaven, that stairway to heaven, the connection between heaven and earth, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We can imagine all of these things to be true. But what we can know for sure, what we can see in this text, is that Jacob is a very changed man here. He doesn't live in accordance to his sin anymore. And he didn't fight with sin in response to Laban's sin against him. You see, Jacob's got far more to teach in this chapter than he has to be taught, than he has to learn from God. Having gone through the same sinful struggles as Laban and having been saved out of them, Jacob actually had a lot to teach Laban through his response to his deception and in the, in the way that he generally lived his life before God. As we considered earlier on, when Jacob arrived, he, he told Laban that uh, he told Laban of his own uh, deceitful scheming, the deceitful scheming that had led him to being sent there to Haran. He also told him that, that God had met with him and he'd opened up heaven to him when his sin had brought him to the lowest and most darkest point of his life. Laban could see himself in his nephew Jacob, but he could also see how God had changed his nephew Jacob. He's seen his God-given physical strength. That was undeniable through the events that happened at the well. He'd seen the, the pure, innocent and God-honouring love that he had for his daughter. He'd seen that he was a man of, of honest, hard graft 
And he loved that so much that he wickedly ensnared Jacob for another seven years longer than he should have done. And after he treated Jacob in such a way, he'd seen him not vengeful, but, but heartbroken. And all the more determined to win the woman that he'd fallen in love with as his bride. How is God's faithfulness penetrating into the heart of this chapter? Into the abuse, the manipulation and the deceit of this chapter? Or could it be? Could it be that, that God was calling Laban to himself through Jacob and through the example of his changed life? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. It could be that. And, and over the weeks, we'll see how Laban responds to the evidence of, of God at work in this young man's life. But before we think about Laban's response to Jacob's example, we need to think about our own response to Jacob's example in this chapter. What does Jacob teach us about our sin? And about our need to come to Jesus for forgiveness. What's his example to us in chapter 29? Well, from the outset, we've seen how Jacob looked at Rachel and his relationship with Rachel. And that's a challenge for us. How, how do we look at members of the opposite sex? Are you pure and innocent in the way that you view members of the opposite sex? Would God be pleased with your thoughts and with your actions when it comes to members of the opposite sex? Or have you failed in this area? Well, if you have failed in your relations to the opposite sex, if you've, if you've uh, failed in, in, in the way that you've looked at them or, or treated them, you know, you can come to Jesus. You can come to Jesus and you can ask him to forgive you, to wash away your sin, to make you pure. And he will. Secondly, what does Jacob teach us about our attitude to work? Are you an honest, hard grafter or are you prone to laziness? And to letting others do what you should be really getting on with in the workplace. Maybe you've got years of guilt and a sense of failure that you just can't shake off. Because you know that you haven't been honest and, and pulling your weight in the workplace, perhaps in the, in the home as well, like you should. Again, if you own such a sense of guilt and, and failure. Jesus came into this world to take that burden of, of, of guilt and failure from off of your shoulders and to forgive you for it. Will you lay that burden down before him? Will you ask him to forgive you for your past failures? Will you allow him to give you a new heart? And a new attitude towards uh, life, towards work, towards your responsibilities within the home. He longs to walk with you and to help you and to help you fulfil your responsibilities to the best of your abilities. Lastly, how do you deal with anger? <laughs> how would you have responded to, to Laban's physical, mental and sexual abuse in this chapter. Maybe it's not, these aren't things that, that you've experienced before, but you know, put yourself in Jacob's shoes here. Of course you would have been angry, wouldn't you? You would have been angry just like Jacob was. And no doubt you would have confronted him in this day and age. You would contact the police as well. But would you have also fought sin with sin? Would you have lashed out? Would you have introduced Laban to your little friend's pain and fury? <laughs> Would you have let your deep anger come out in a torrent of abusive language? 
Would you have allowed yourself to have got embroiled in a very public and heated spat on social media? Or would you have not done anything and allowed that, that, that hurt and that anger to seep deep down into your heart where that grudge would fester and grow and hope for a day of sweet vengeance that will never come will occupy you for many days like it did for Esau just a few chapters ago. Well, Jacob didn't do any of that. He didn't take justice into his own hands because he trusted in a God that was able to bring justice uh, that was far fairer and far more wider reaching than anything he could muster. Now, if you've been on the receiving abuse, like uh, the receiving end of abuse like Jacob, maybe not to the extent of Jacob, perhaps, but if you've been on the receiving end of hurt like this and pain like this, there is somewhere you can go with that hurt and with that pain. You don't have to lash out and you don't have to keep it in. You can put your trust in the God of the universe. You can entrust injustice into the hands of the judge of all humanity. And you can find rest and peace. The rest and peace that you need in Jesus. Jesus said, come to me all you who are wearied and burdened and I will give you rest. Jesus died to forgive messed up people like you, like, like me like Jacob and Laban in this chapter. We fail in all areas of life. Jesus wants to forgive that, to, to, to set you free from sin and from the guilt of sin. He wants to walk with you in life, to change you and to help you and to comfort you when all's not right, just like he did for Jacob question is will you come to him this morning for those things for the for the help for the comfort and the uh, the change that you need in your life will you come to Jesus lay your burdens down before him ask him for his forgiveness ask him for his new life let's come to him now together in prayer let's pray Lord Jesus, we thank you for this passage in the Bible, how it shows uh, your faithfulness in the face of humanity's unfaithfulness. Lord God, it, it shows that you are at work in this messy world, in and through the lives of messy people like Jacob, like Laban. Lord, and we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that that you are a God who forgives. You are a God who forgave Jacob at the lowest and uh, most sinful part, the most darkest part of his life as he was in, in that, on that journey towards Haran. And thank you that you met with him, that you changed his life, that you turned it completely upside down uh, through Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you could do the same through Laban, that you were inviting him into a relationship with yourself through the example of Jacob in this chapter and Lord we don't know at this point what the response of, of Laban was but we need to know uh, what our response is Lord um, will we be challenged and, and changed by uh, lay, uh, by Jacob's example in this chapter Lord will you will we allow you to work in our lives in the area of our relationship with members of the opposite sex in our relationship with with work and 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 how we deal with, with anger as well. Lord, we lay these things before you and we, we confess our failure in them. Lord, we confess that the sin that is just, oh, that our lives are saturated in. We confess that to you and we ask for your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came into this world. You came into this world to, to absorb our sin, to take it upon yourself. And to die for it upon that cross so that we may be forgiven, so that we might be welcomed into a new life with you and eventually into 
a new heavenly life with you that will last for eternally, eternity. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful and beautiful things. And Lord, we ask that you would, in this life, you would help us, that you would comfort us. Um, Lord, that you would be with us through everything uh, that we go through. And life is, is not all right, Lord. We ask that we would look to you, that we would follow you closely and that we would walk in your light and your life in this world. Amen. Great, we're going to sing our closing song now. And then five minutes after that, please do uh, come uh, to our Zoom room and uh, enjoy some tea and coffee and some chat together there. See you shortly. God bless.